Hey, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us today on our podcast, Maker Connect. My name is Matt Despins, and I'll be your host for the show. With me today, we have Matt Getty, who is a partner here at the firm, a true negotiation tactician, and an architect in its highest form. Also joining us today is our guest, Pete Tunkey. But we have some exciting news about Pete. Not only is Pete also a true tactician, but he's actually joining the Maker Group on July 3rd here as a partner. So we're super excited to not only have him, but how lucky am I on the podcast today to have two people to learn from and two of my bosses on the same podcast. I hope I don't screw this up. The one thing that we try really hard to do in this podcast is to keep the acronyms and the buzzwords to a minimum. We also like to keep it fun, relaxed, and casual because after all, while negotiations are complicated, we do try to keep it as simple as possible. So um, with that being said, uh, Pete, I would like to ask you, and if you're open to it, I'd love to start by asking you to tell us a little bit about your career and your background so the listeners can get a flavor of your negotiation experience. Also, maybe you can let us know at what point in your career did you discover the importance of negotiations and actually start to take it seriously? Here's the deal. I don't want you to be shy. No doubt you've already worked really hard in your career and the listeners want to hear about it. So with that, I'll leave it to you, sir. Well, thank you. So excited to uh, not only join the Make Group, but to be on this podcast. It's good stuff. I guess my career started in college with Coca-Cola. I had the, uh, the lucky time to be an intern at the Coca-Cola bottling company, Tallahassee, Florida, um, and moved on through a number of roles with Coke USA in food service space selling to local mom and pop restaurants all the way up to national accounts with Sonic uh, and mm. manage the SRI, which is their the biggest group from an ownership perspective. Um, that's probably when I really started to learn about negotiation, to be honest. The negotiations that we had from a uh, national perspective across the Sonic system for Coke, absolutely phenomenal. Um, huge learning space for me. I had some really interesting leaders who looked and understood the nuance of the value of the Coke brand. So that's where I started to learn. Um, from there, I went on to a number of different roles. I actually owned and operated my own restaurants for three oh, wow. years in um, Arizona. Love that. We had a, a college franchise right next to ASU. Um, ended up with five restaurants. Sold that and missed my time in CPG so much. Wanted to leverage my marketing experience. Went and joined PepsiCo. So I had three years with Pepsi um, as a customer marketing manager. Uh, did everything from customer marketing through with some of the, the big enterprise activities like NASCAR, Major League Baseball, NFL, uh, learned a tremendous amount of through the experience in this space of marketing, brand marketing across Walmart, Target, um, tied to some of those really big enterprises like NASCAR, Major League Baseball. From there, was interested in retail. So I joined PetSmart and I was in the Omni marketing team for PetSmart and really learned some of the nuances of what a, a retailer does from an operation perspective, specifically around private label. So spent a lot of time in the, the dog food space, um, okay. a lot of time thinking differently about how do I get shoppers excited? How do I get pet parents at the time excited to buy from PetSmart and drive that loyalty? There's nothing better than pet parents, right? I think we've all got <laughs> um, And then from there, I actually rejoined Coca-Cola. So I had a couple of years, both domestically and globally. I was on the, the global subway team, um, helped steward and manage and negotiate some of the relationships between Coca-Cola and various marketing enterprises that did business with Subway. So really interesting exposure and experience to get sort of a, a third party lens to negotiating on behalf of Subway, but to spend the money of Coca-Cola to bring that brand to life. From there, I joined the, the Gap Partnership, which was a, a UK-based negotiation consultancy. I led the Americas towards the end of my time there. Um, and really had fun in the space of CPG and worked with a number of domestic and global clients on some of their biggest initiatives, creating strategies. Um, there is a, a time along the way that I, I remember as we're building a strategy and a senior leader had been doing the work for 20 plus years, mm -hmm. just sort of came to that realization of how emotional negotiations can be. And mm -hmm. one of the, the biggest takeaways I had from a negotiation perspective was how do you think and bring to life your energy, your commitment for the business, but not that personal side, not that sort of inner strength of, it's not a, a personal decision, it's a business decision. I think that was one of the really turning moments for me, um, understanding some of this, the art of negotiation. 
from there, I joined the, oh, I'm sorry. You want me to jump no, the question? no, go, no, go right ahead, sir. I know it just keeps going. From no, this is, this is exactly what we want. This is exactly what the listeners want to hear. So go ahead, my friend. Do I want to go deeper into any of the experiences or is this the right pace? No, this is the perfect pace. Yep. Okay. You're doing exactly right. Okay. From there, I joined the, the Capri group and Capri group was really the beginning of building out my experience within the sales and capability space for consulting. There was a blend of negotiation, but there was also a deeper understanding of some of the capabilities that organizations need to bring forward within the space of selling, within the space of marketing, operations, supply chain. Um, So it was really a transformational time for me to learn not only how do I sell consulting at a broader portfolio, but how do you integrate negotiation with sales capabilities? How do you integrate that with supply chain and purchasing. Um, A lot of our clients in in the space are really challenged with developing their leaders into general managers of the business. So having a a deep understanding of how supply chain works with marketing, works with brand, works with sales, has been phenomenal. From there, I helped the the business get acquired by ThoughtLogic. And most recently, I was with ThoughtLogic as a senior client partner and leveraged some of my experiences, but really drove sales, drove those Mm -hmm. strategic partnerships to bring the most meaningful solutions forward for my clients. We had a number of clients that were transforming their business, whether it is acquiring a new business or brand, integrating multiple companies into one operating structure, uh, or just helping stand up a new team within a company. Bringing all that experience, bringing the thought about what's imperative within sales capabilities across the marketplace, um, that's really what my last couple of years have been all about. Well, I'd like to draw attention to a couple of things there. First off, the uh, unbelievable range of experience and expertise there. That's that's truly impressive. Um, I mean, when you hear names like, uh, you know, Coke and Pepsi um, and PetSmart, first off, you're talking to a guy who's absolutely obsessed with his dog. So instantly when you said that, um, I smiled. Um, and another thing about that that I want to draw attention to is in talking about um, the Gap Partnership in that I... I believe uh, we have somebody else on this call who you might have actually been their supervisor. Is that right? Do we, is it the other founder here in the call, Mr. Matt Getty? Matt, let's start with, am I correct that Pete at one point was your supervisor? He was, he was my first boss at the Gap Partnership. (laughs) He was your first boss. Wow. So, so you must've not only gotten to know Pete, um, from the sense of the Gap Partnership, but you guys probably had a lot of communications about his background and stuff too. So in addition to everything that he just said, what else do you want to add on to what you know about Pete and his perceptions of negotiation, both in the corporate world when he was in the corporate world and at the Gap Partnership? What are your thoughts there? Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, one of the reasons, one of the things I learned from Pete early on was just, he mentioned it before, just the, the fact that negotiation, especially professional negotiations, it's not a, it's not a personal, emotional decision, right? It's a business. It's a planning process. It's a, it's a planning decision. That's why I'm thrilled that Pete's coming on board with, with the Maker Group to really help expand our sales capability, training systems, analytical work, uh, developing customer engagement models, sales planning models, and even compensation models kind of soup to nuts. And so just that breadth of experience. Learned a lot, Pete, but really excited for you to kind of bring those new skills uh, to our organization as we expand kind of... Um, the halo effect of negotiation from sales all the way down to uh, <clears throat> executing negotiations for our clients. As yeah, I mean, I, it's, it was a, a funny thing that as, as Matt Getty and I were sort of talking about opportunities and what the future could look like. It was one of those great moments in life too, where not only did I see Matt as a, a past employee, but it was great to see what he's built. And that's one of the reasons I joined this company is confidence in what we're doing um, confidence in the team that Matt's built. So it's awesome to be here. Yeah. And as a moment of, um, you know, full transparency, um, you know, just having Matt and in my experiences so far with, with Pete, ha- watching the two of them transact and talk about negotiations has truly been eye opening. I think a lot of people come into, um, in their professional world, they think that they're good negotiation, uh, good good negotiators, or they understand it. But then you get in front of a couple of people like you, and just because that's your background, you realize how talented the two of you really are. So, um, super grateful to have you not only at the Maker Group, but for me personally to learn from. Um, 
both of you touched on um, the emotions of negotiation, some of that part. So I'd like to dive into a question here and ask, you know, movies uh, portray negotiations with pounding fists on tables, intense facial expressions, yelling with emotions and manipulations and basically other shenanigans. What do you think, Pete, is the biggest difference between real life negotiations and the ones that we see in the movies? If you had to pick one or two things, what would you say? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is time, the time and energy, time thinking about the planning, getting ready and prepared, both with the, the tactical moves that you want to bring in and introduce into negotiation, but just that emotional journey and thinking about how quick movies portray negotiations where it's almost <laughs> 30 seconds, you're in, you're out, you've come to a conclusion, you've been hugely successful. I think in the real world, more negotiations take weeks, if not months, to really be effective. And I think you have that, and I'll just keep hitting on emotions for a second. You've got that personal emotional journey that you're thinking through and your confidence level goes up and then you hit a wall and how you overcome that challenge, how you think differently about reacting to something you hadn't planned for, readjusting, I think is phenomenally important in real world negotiations. Um, and at the end of the day, it can be just as rewarding, just as exciting when you reach that end, especially if the negotiation along the way was a different outcome that you anticipated. I'll, I'll give you a great example. Please do. About 10 years ago, I was negotiating um, with my, my time at PepsiCo, and I was negotiating with a major league baseball player. And yeah. this player, phenomenal. And he had some family that was also in sports. And we were going through the negotiation and I had planned out financially, I had aligned internally with the company on what we wanted to accomplish, what we were trying to do with his likeness, with his image, with him as a, as a partner and representative of the brand. And as we're going through the negotiation, it became more and more clear that I hadn't hit on something that was really important to him. And what he was trying to accomplish was having a bigger impact in the marketplace than his brother, who was also <laughs> a major sports figure. And at the end of the day, by giving him the chance to have his visual, his face on the side of the building was more exciting to him than just a couple extra zeros on that contract. So that emotional understanding, that journey is so different for everybody. So talking about identifying those drivers and, you know, Matt Getty, you know, I, I know I hear you talk a lot about um, making sure in, I think... Let me back up for a minute. I think that a lot of times when people hear the word negotiations, they instantly think about a confrontational challenge. They instantly think about it as being me against you. And I need to put you in the worst possible position and me in the best possible position. And Matt Gide, I know you have some thoughts about that, about letting the other person go back and be a champion. Can you tell us a little bit about that in terms of, because what Pete's describing is a process that is lengthy and that it has some, some, some respect and some um, goals of, of, of coming to a good partnership together. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. I mean, we, we, we talk about it a lot where it's, it's understanding what's important to the other party and finding how are you to going to deliver them satisfaction. So it's, I'm curious, Pete, what is, What's your model? What's your framework to really understand the priorities of the other party, right? That the, the baseball player, how did you understand or when did you understand or, or what, what did you employ that could be replicable to, to larger sales organizations about really understanding that priority uh, for that individual, which it allows you to, yeah, to unlock massive amounts of value and save the organization quite a bit of money because you understood, hey, I just really want my face on the side of the building to show to my brother that I'm <laughs> Right. You know, it, it does come down to value. It comes down to either asking the right questions. It comes down to thinking and being proactive in terms of get your sort of mind in where that other party is. What looks amazing to them? What would change their, their approach to the business challenge, their approach to success? And what does success look like to them? I think in that specific example, it actually came to life. I was having lunch with, with the player and we're sitting down, we're just talking about life in general. So it was sort of a, an off the record moment where we had the opportunity just to, to be personal, to be a little bit unguarded and really talk about life, 
and what they're trying to accomplish across their career. And I think that applies to big commercial negotiations as well. If you can understand what that other negotiator is trying to accomplish for their business, but also what their personal motivators are along the line. If they're trying to get promoted, if they're trying to just secure a deal to keep the ball moving forward, I think those are very different motivators. So really spending time to understand the negotiator as an individual, as a person, investing that time, that's critical. Does that mean that we can't do that in one hour, like in a movie, Pete? It's not going to happen in one hour. <laughs> Sometimes you can, more times than not, you can. <laughs> Go ahead, Matt, you had something to say. Yeah, I was going to say, Pete, I know like in, at, at Capri, at that logic and, and what you're bringing here is, is really setting up that, that sales engagement model. Is that part of kind of, I mean, I think a lot of, a lot of sales teams lack that time, that process to really understand the priorities of the other party, right? The human element, understanding their KPIs. I mean, what are your recommendations? If, if I'm a sales leader, how do I get my team into that mindset, into that framework? What does that look like? Yeah, I think one of the biggest gaps that we see is there's so much pressure on a sales organization just to sell price and pack. Like it's very tactical. It's very almost order taking oriented. And one of the biggest things when we partner with our clients, and we really reinforce leaders is give teams the chance to step back and really think objectively about their relationship, identify motivators, identify some of the key barriers that have happened in the past that we need to overcome and really be thoughtful on what does this relationship look like from a, a client and a supplier relationship in terms of what great could be. And then let's think about the steps to take to solve that then worry about how to sell, what to sell. But really, initially, it's about stepping back and understanding broadly what that professional relationship looks like between the two companies. I think that's one of the biggest gaps we see out there. It's too much about just selling versus growing. And I think that's a, a really unique difference is how do I help my customer, my client grow their business and being objective in that space? That's a massive one. Yeah, that's a really good point. I mean, I think to your also too is forgotten uh, by a lot of different sales teams and as it relates to negotiations as well, which is our intention here or any, any good company's intention should not be just to sell something to somebody else. We should become a partner in your growth, right? We should become a trusted resource that is embedded in your processes and in your team so much that we're both going to be benefiting. So am I understanding you correctly, Pete, that we're talking about positioning any sales team, positioning themselves to help their partner grow? Yeah, you're exactly right. And I think the key part is team. That's the other big sort of unlock for a lot of our clients is it's not just that one lead salesperson, but how do you leverage the entire organization? How do you bring the right leaders, the right support team forward to support that client, to support that retailer and CPG and really differentiate your company to be a trusted partner. I think that's the end goal for a lot of clients is, how do I want the other party, the retailer, to really think differently about us as a partner? Yeah, and I think that you know one of the unique things too that we offer here at the Maker Group is you know Maker Connect, uh, that platform, whereas not only are you pre-planning and, and getting help executing and recording all the details of your negotiations, but also it puts some synergy in the team to what you're talking about, Pete, so that everybody can be on the same page and kind of tracking in the same direction. Um, I know that you're you're new here coming on with us. Have you had the opportunity to look at Maker Connect at all yet? Absolutely. I've actually okay. been in a couple of the uh, training courses as well. So okay. really excited to to be a facilitator someday down the road in the uh, not too distant future. Cool. All right. Sounds good. Matt, did you have anything you wanted to add about that? No, 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 no. I think it's, okay. again, it just comes down to process and it comes down to planning. And I think to Pete's point, it's, it's, it's time, right? How, how do you, yeah. how do you build processes in your sales organization that don't make people feel like it's mundane, but it feels like you're giving them back their time. You're giving them back the ability to be creative and be proactive um, and I don't know if you see this, but I see with a lot of our clients, it's just constantly reacting, reacting, reacting. And if you're always reacting, you're never being strategic. And so, um, yeah, it's just, it's a massive hurdle for a lot of these organizations to overcome. And I, I think we know the, the ones that understand that it's, it's worth looking at kind of the organization, how we go to market soup to nuts and how we engage with our customers and kind of this, this new norm post pandemic is, is absolutely critical. 
Yeah. One more point about that before we move on, you know, talking about uh, the differences of reactivity versus maybe anticipating a need and, and how that builds trust and relationship. You know, think about it when we all go out to a restaurant and you're sitting there and your water glass is about to get empty. It's a big difference between when the waiter comes over and fills it before you ask versus you needing to raise your hand five times and waiting 10 minutes, right? So I think that when you really dive into what the needs of your clients are and you look at that, you can start to anticipate what they are and start to make sure that we're not just reacting, that we're doing things that show them what we actually care about their happiness, their well-being, their profitability, right? Absolutely. Okay, cool. So let's talk, uh, Pete, for a second. Let's talk a minute about negotiations as either or both in art and the science. Which side of that school of thought do you feel a little bit more aligned with? Do you think it's more of an art or more of a science? Yeah, I definitely think both come to play. But in my mind, there is more science in your preparation and there's more sort of structured process opportunity in your preparation. When you get into the negotiation, I think that's the opportunity for art to play a a bigger role. Uh And if I think about some of the uh, most fun negotiations, and I I say fun a little bit loosely, (laughs) knowing that there have been many times where you go in there and you are quite nervous. Um, I think the the art can come to life when you start to, to really balance that emotional journey for yourself and the other party. And I actually had a, a client at Coca-Cola who described uh, negotiation as art. And the art was the idea that you can paint a picture, a strategic high level opportunity for the negotiation. And then as you're in that negotiation and you start to apply the methodologies and you start to, to think about all the levels of success that you're going to deliver, that level of satisfaction for the client, I think the art becomes how you deliver that and how you can sort of challenge your emotional reaction to different aspects of the negotiation, how you can help the other party be successful and sort of see their way to that success. That's where the art comes to life. Interesting. That, that actually makes complete sense. So, so talking about it with the beginning stages of it being a bit more of a science, the planning of it and then the execution turning a bit more into an art form. Um, Matt Getty, I'd love to ask you when we get to the stage of it being, you know what, actually check that I'm going to go the other way in it, in in the science part of it, in the beginning, um, because you're, you're really tactical, you're really analytical and good at thinking things through like that. What do you think some of the most important things are that people can be doing in those science called science analytical beginning stages? What are some of the most important things for them to be thinking about and considering? Pete, Hannah, I went off to you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, one of the things that, I, that I've seen be really effective from a strategy perspective is thinking about how I can deliver success with a shopper in mind. So if I'm keeping myself in my retail sort of CPG landscape, really big ideas need to be grounded in what success looks like for the other party. And most merchandisers out there, they are struggling to pull new shoppers in the door. And they want to think about how do I differentiate my business from the marketplace? So as I thought about planning, as I think about planning rather on what does great look like from a science perspective, it's, it's really thinking through delivering success at almost a daily, monthly, quarterly, and yearly perspective for my client. If I'm going to be in a specific line review negotiation, for example, I've got to really understand how my products play in the broader category and how my offers, my solutions can drive incremental value and success for that retailer. Yeah. I, so what I, if, if I'm hearing correctly, it's really about looking at it from a 3000 foot view, so to speak, and making sure that we're covering all of the factors involved. Is that right? Yeah. And I hate that answer. That's the one I hope your editing person can scrub out and remove. Now that I like think through what I just said. I was so excited to hear what Matt had to say. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Well, you know, that's okay. So we'll just, we'll actually, we'll, we'll, we'll cross that one off. So we'll, we'll get uh, Steve to uh, so we'll do it at 9.37. We'll just get rid of that whole question. Um, 
Okay, so um, Pete, it's a little bit of a sensitive topic right now in society in general, but what about AI? There's a ton of conversation out there now about how AI will affect, of course, many different industries. Some of the ones that you hear the most about are HR, legal, accounting, insurance, and, and obviously thousands of others. But I'm interested to hear what your thoughts are on AI and negotiations. And I'd like to ask that just in two small parts. AI in terms of if it's ethical, you know, or if it's an unfair advantage, and is it useful? Or maybe on the flip side, you might feel that it's not really ethical, it's an unfair advantage, or maybe it's not useful. So I think from an overall standpoint, what are your thoughts on AI in negotiations? I'm sure we all have our thoughts about it in, in society, but about yeah. negotiations. Yeah, no, I think that's a, a great space. One, I think it's going to be critical long-term. And long-term, I mean, over the next two years, the amount of, of data and information that you've got to consider and plan for, I think for a lot of negotiators is overwhelming. If you think about sure. how many items are sold across categories and how many different retailers are interacting with suppliers and manufacturers, I think we're at a very early stage on how AI can really come to life within negotiations. And the initial steps will be in the space of helping to clean up the data to really identify the biggest areas of opportunity. And that's why I think it's going to be a huge value add. I think when we can train the systems to understand what we're trying to accomplish and evaluate the mass amounts of data that would inform better decisions, would inform better negotiation tactics and strategies, I think we'll be in a really good spot. I do think there's a bit of an, uh, I guess, an unfair balance today where the retailers are really getting ahead of a lot of suppliers in the space. And ah. They've got broader amounts of data, vaster resources that are focused against their specific channel, category, their customer base. So I actually see the need for suppliers to better leverage, to better think about how AI can be brought into their businesses to be more successful in negotiations. I think that's the biggest challenge ahead of us. Interesting. Okay. So it sounds like right now the retailers are, are um, utilizing that maybe a bit more than the suppliers. Um, Matt Getty, um, I know that uh, we have some plans uh, ourselves here at the Maker Group to integrate AI at some point um, in a more robust way into our tool, Maker Connect. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about the thought process on why we decided to do that and and how we envision that working in our platform well it's it's i mean pete nailed it uh retailers have dedicated massive 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 amounts of resources dollars people uh and they saw this coming a couple of years ago right or even longer than that and so for for a lot of our manufacturing clients right it's it's the lacking of proactivity that has kind of put them behind the game. It's the lacking of appropriate resources. And so what we're doing is we're building out the systems that a lot of these people should have built themselves internally, but either, again, resources, uh, lacking of expertise, lacking of time, um, where we're going to be able to, yeah, parse this data, understand the solutions, and, and to Pete's point, really figuring out and training the machine learning, the AI process to figure out risks, opportunities, and threats across the customer, across the category, uh, and really trying to automate um, category insights and category captainship for these clients. And then we come in and we, we help them coach how they should be negotiating, how they should build in that partnership, and then utilizing Pete's methodologies and solutions. How do you look at a one, two, three-year plan to really partner and grow? And I love what Pete said earlier, where most salespeople think that selling is selling, but in reality, selling is growth. And so that's just a really key focus uh, for what we're trying to do with our clients. And Pete, when you look at kind of best in class, utilizing data from a manufacturing standpoint, what are they doing uh, and what, what gaps exist, do you think, in terms of just most manufacturers out there in the consumer package good space? Yeah, I think the best in class always start with a, a broader category lens. And they really want to understand how does that category perspective across the entire business, not just at a single retailer or not just within what would traditionally be a channel, really mean. And the, the blending of channels has been happening for so long. 
I think one of the things that the, the marketplace is moving to is really about thinking shopper and consumer. And what is the, the solution? What is the challenge? What does that solve for that shopper that you're trying to meet with your products? And from there, you can develop really good, robust growth strategies to drive strategy. And I think that's what retailers were needing is how do I drive my entire category? Not just how do I sell more of one item, one product. <sighs> that's what, uh, that's the problem to solve, isn't it? And that's where we have to come in and partner with our clients to help them solve that. Cause the ones that do are the ones that are going to win and the ones that don't are the ones that are going to fall behind. And again, I think with how quickly things are progressing and how quickly some of these new AI machine learning solutions are being adopted. Um, if, if you miss or you delay yourself for a year, it could actually end up being three or four years where you find yourself behind. And that's just uh, absolute killer when you're trying to stay competitive in a category. Yeah. And that's been a, a huge learning, I think for even the top, suppliers out there, the manufacturers, when they look at how fast data is shifting and changing, the need for answers, the need for insights, it is now measured in days versus traditionally <laughs> it's three to six months where I would run some reports, I pull a team together, and then I'd come up with some ideas. Three months, six months from now, everything changes and you've got to start over. And that's the, the advantage that I think we can bring them is how do you turn thoughts into insights and action? within weeks and days instead of months and years. Well, I want the listeners to know here as well that uh, your podcast host here is getting taken to school. I mean, I hope you guys listening to this are as impressed as I am. I'm like, wow, what a, what a breadth and depth of knowledge. Holy cow. Um, so it's clear though, in listening that, um, you know, AI and those strategies, I mean, things are, are happening much quicker. So, so things that, that used to take time and, and multiple steps, that time period is, is condensing. And so the ones who are going to be successful are the ones who are going to adapt to that and, and be able to accomplish the same thing much quicker. So for sure, for sure that's here. And that's something I think that every organization should be taking a, a very close look at. Um, Pete, when you think about different types of negotiations, what are a couple of the biggest differences that you think in terms of planning and execution between, say, a multi-million dollar corporate negotiation, multi-million dollar corporate negotiation? Uh, we can get rid of that. Let's actually start with a question. So, Sorry about that. Uh, that dog, no, no problem. No. <laughs> That's smart. Uh, so the um, uh, when Pete, when you think about some of the different types of negotiations, what are a couple of the biggest differences in terms of planning and executing between maybe a multi-million dollar corporate negotiation with procurement or sales versus an end of just a regular person individual negotiating on their own? with a car salesperson for a new vehicle. So I guess what the question is, the different components in a high level complex corporate deal versus going to buy your Toyota Tundra pickup truck. What are some of the differences there? But, I mean, the obvious one is relationship differences, right? But I want to unpack that a little bit. When you're buying a car, sure. chances are you'll never see that person again. And you should really optimize that negotiation. But when I am negotiating from a corporate lens or I'm representing a brand, it is not just this one negotiation that you should be considering and not just this one individual you're negotiating with. It really is the breadth of the relationship over the years to come. And quite frankly, it's a recognition of the years of past. What that precedent had been like, what we had accomplished or haven't accomplished over the years, but also what that future obligation or the future relationship could look like. I think one of the, the unique aspects of negotiation is it's a chance to really formalize what my multi-year relationship will be with a partner mm. and to put some guardrails in place, to put some objectives and ideally some usual goals. And I think that's the piece that we often miss within negotiation is how do I think about long-term aspirations of our two companies and how do I put in place sort of the roadmap to get there? Even if I'm negotiating for a holiday promotion next weekend, I still should be thoughtful on how do I 
consider and capture future holidays? How do I grow the relationship between my brand and this company? And I think that's the, the nuance as we consider relationships within negotiations is how do I think thoughtfully about that long-term impact and then achieve that? I think that's the biggest gap and the biggest difference. That makes perfect sense to me. And I hear Matt Getty talk about that, you know, constantly all the time, which is relationship, 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 right? And so that's the mark of one of the marks of um, a good negotiator, I think, is focusing on that. Matt, you're a huge relationship guy. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, if you have to go back and have a conversation with this person again, depending on how you left that last conversation, it's going to massively impact your future conversations. So I think it's, again, I think it's the world is shifting from reactive tactical negotiations to collaborative long-term focused solutions. And how do both parties get what they need? How do both parties partner and win? And so the clients that are adapting to that new norm, we see them growing, we see them winning. The ones that aren't, the ones that are just focusing heavily on, this is what I need. This is what I have to do. They're just, they're, they're missing out on opportunities otherwise that are granted to potentially competitors in their space because competitors are leaning in more. And it's not just leaning in with money. It's leaning in with collaboration, with ideas, with really figuring out, hey, how do we, how do we really differentiate each other uh, to be successful? So the takeaway for me from both of you on this is don't treat corporate negotiations like a used card sales deal. Don't, don't do that. Is that right? Definitely not. If you're slinging chicken, you know what? Once you're trying, you're trying to offload a truck or you're trying to uh, liquidate a tanker of oil someplace, you know, Matt, you you go ahead. You treat it like your tundra negotiation. Well, I mean, you know, I think uh, I think that you have a little bit of um, uh, retail uh, product sales experience in your background, right? At one point, you had your own line of organic skincare. Is that right? Oh yeah, yeah. Yep. And so, and and so in in, in that world as well, uh, I think you know. Though when when you actually let's let's touch on that for a quick second when because you have talked about it in the past when you had that was a negotiation for you is that right when you ended up selling that brand am I correct Yeah yeah I mean our, every, we talk about everything in life is a negotiation when you're selling your business it's talk about getting your emotions involved <laughs> Yeah that, well that, you, you 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 actually you actually took you actually took the words out of my mouth I was going to ask you you know talking about emotions you know real quick what was that like for you. Yeah, no, I, again, but I think it's it's being able to separate the fact that hey, this is this is still a business decision, and they're operating in a business perspective, and not allowing you to get in your own way. I think that's what happens to a lot of people is they allow their emotions to get in their own way, and they don't follow the process, they don't follow the plan, they don't follow their customer engagement model. Um, they, they put too much of them into it, and when you do that, I mean, you're already way behind the game because now you're, you're, you're negotiating from an an emotional standpoint and that's just, it's never a recipe for success. It's the old Mike Tyson thing, right? Everybody thinks they have a plan until they get punched in the face. So uh, we'll go with uh, one final question here for Pete and Matt, give you a second to chime in if if you want. So um, Pete, at this point in your career, you've seen hundreds and probably thousands of corporate negotiations. Um, what do you think or what have you seen um, people in corporate negotiations be most fearful of going into the negotiation and and maybe what their biggest area of improvement is? Maybe those two are the same thing or, or maybe they're different. Uh, but generally speaking, what's your thoughts and opinions on that? Yeah, I think it boils down to confidence and it's confidence or the lack of confidence in the outcome. And so much is driven off of potential consequences. And what I've seen over the years is if you can be really clear on what the outcome is that you want to achieve and what that outcome will do for the other party, what it helps them enable, what it helps them become successful with, your confidence level increases. The individuals who are really a bit short-sighted and they're not considering that destination, I think that's the biggest area of opportunity. And that's time in and time out when I'm consulting, when I'm helping someone on my team, a client build their strategy. It really is starting with where's the destination and then how do we ensure we get there in a really positive and collaborative fashion. I think that's the the piece that I'm excited to get back to is spending a lot more time with my clients, with my team, driving down to those results. 
I think that's what I'd love to sort of leave folks with is be thoughtful on that destination first, then craft and create the right plan. Relationship, relationship, relationship. Um, have I, as the host, had the right takeaway here on this? Absolutely. I mean, from, bo- from, from both you, Matt. Okay, well, and I know... I know with being here at the maker group, I, I know that's what the feeling is every day and, and listening to, um, you know, hundreds of conversations about negotiations every week. Um, it is all centered around the relationship. So uh, with that, uh, Pete, first off, as a guest, uh, thank you so much. I mean, your experience is so incredibly impressive. And also, in case I wasn't already super excited about having you join us here at the Maker Group, now I'm even 10 times more excited. And, and thank you so much um, for agreeing to come aboard and join the team. No, I, I'm very excited about the opportunity and uh, looking forward to it. So thanks for the time today. Yeah, no yeah. problem. Uh, any uh, founder closing comments here, uh, Mr. Matt Getty? Nope. It's all about the relationship. <laughs> <laughs> relationship. Really, 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 really appreciate the time.